You're hey, welcome everybody to a webinar navigating the government market during the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, we'll begin starting in a second. I just want to come on a little early to kind of do a few quick mic checks to make sure that everybody can hear us okay. Uh, for those of you who are uh, online, uh, all of you are muted right now, but if you could let me know in the chat area whether you can hear me okay, that would be awesome. In the chat area, okay, Guy, thanks so much. I uh, appreciate you uh, letting me know. And um, so we'll begin starting in a few minutes. Wait till about uh, three, four more minutes before at 12 noon we'll start uh, exactly on time. And uh, appreciate all of you joining us today. I've got uh, our special guest co host today, uh, Charlene Fitzpatrick. She'll be on. She's already on, but I'll introduce her to everybody in a second. So hang on tight. We'll get started in one minute. All right, everybody, um, we're going to get started in a second. I just want to kind of get started. My name is Abraham Sion with the Government Contractors Association. Uh, to get started, I want to just share a little bit about uh, what's going on and hear a little about from everybody what's going on in your sector of the world. And uh, I've got a friend of mine, Guy Burns, out in Las Vegas. So we're going to chit chat a little bit for a few minutes until it is time to start. So, Guy, uh, I've unmuted you. And so if you can just share a little bit what's going on in Nevada and, and Las Vegas. Yeah, we're pretty much uh, we're pretty much completely locked down here. Uh, all casinos, all bars, all everything that's fun <laughs> is closed here. Um, my industry as a professional speaker has obviously been devastated. Um, there's thousands of us that make our living by traveling, doing training, doing keynote speeches. Uh, obviously, travels curtailed. Companies aren't training because they don't even know if they're going to stay in business. So it's a uh, uh, interesting world that we're in right now. So they are, they've got Las Vegas completely locked down. You can't leave unless for essential purposes. Is that it? Um, they haven't stopped us from like hiking and things like that yet. Um, they've closed all businesses, all hair salons, all of pretty much anything except for gas stations, medical and grocery stores are, are the only thing that's open. Um, mm -hmm. They haven't made it. Uh, I took a motorcycle ride on Sunday out around an area called Red Rock Loop, which is a, a famous uh, canyon. They have the tourist attraction itself closed down, but there were hundreds of cars just parked alongside the road out hiking. People are just going stir crazy here because um, you know, there's nothing to do. There's no shows. Um, we usually go to a show at least once a week or every other week. Um, you know, comedy show or something happening here in Vegas. Uh, nobody can do that now. And um, so it's just um, it's pretty, pretty crazy energy uh, because Vegas is one of the main reasons I live in Vegas is it thrives on energy. The, the buzz, the lights, the, uh, and it's just a, a really weird feeling going out in Vegas and having uh, having it almost shut down. OK, wow. Yeah, we are living in a unprecedented uh, time and, you know, lots of things happening every day. There's a new change, a new uh update you know we all need to be kind of be diligent in terms of what's going on at any given time so yes we are living in a whole new world right now well hey it is uh, a little bit after 12 o'clock so let's go ahead and get this webinar started i appreciate everybody joining us uh, my name is abraham siong i am the founder of the government contractors association and with me here i've got charlene fitzpatrick with uh, h3c uh, she is an HR consultant in the HR world. And so we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, how coronavirus and the COVID-19 is impacting your businesses and business all around the country. Uh, and with a very special focus on the government market. So we're going to be talking about business in general, but we're also going to be talking about the, the government contracting market itself and, and what you can consider and what are some things to uh, process and think through as a government contractor uh, in this session here. Uh, we've decided to do this every Wednesday. So every Wednesday we'll be doing a webinar. We'll bring you different uh, 
co-host to kind of navigate this here. Uh, next week, we've got Guy Burns, and we've got uh, a few other pending people that will join us next week. And so I appreciate everybody joining us. Uh, to kind of take care of a few order of business, if you are here, you can download some of the content from govassociation.org forward slash coronavirus. Uh, we're putting, we're aggregating different resources onto that site there uh, so that you can go and get the download. I haven't put the PowerPoint on it, but after today's session, I will put this PowerPoint on, on there as well. So feel free to take as many notes as you want, but uh, it will be available on the site, govassociation.org forward slash coronavirus. Uh, so you can download the PowerPoint there, as well as uh, Charlene, she's gonna provide a document that will be available that is already on the site. So you can download her, her document there as well. Now we've got um, uh, lots of people joining us for this webinar. And so uh, to kind of get started, I just wanna kind of get a pulse of, of uh, what type of businesses you have and, and about how many, uh, if you are an employer, how many businesses or how many employees do you have? Uh, and so, and if some of you want to chime in, uh, you know, raise your hand or in the chat area say, you know, unmute me. And what I'll do is I'll unmute you to kind of get a little dialogue going before we go to some of the content that we prepare a little bit for everybody. Uh, so if you're in the area here, go ahead and put in there if you want to share what's happening in your neck of the world, as well as the comments you want to share with everybody, uh, please in the chat area, uh, put in the chat area and then we will uh, unmute you. And so, so you can hear us. Babe, I'm unmuted, you can hear me, right? Yes, uh-huh. Okay, this is Myra. There is somebody on the line that um, needs a call-in number because they said they don't have any audio. So I don't know if you can pass that out to everyone. So um, go ahead, um, type it into the chat area, Kim, and, and the, the number and the uh, code. Yeah. Wonderful. And then the other thing is that, can you put your, your screen in the presentation mode? Because we've got the presenter view. Oh, it's not in presentation mode? Let me find that then. Yeah, right there in the, the three dots. There you go. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Uh, the number should be if you go to the invite, and then it should be the number and the, the code. Do you see it? Go to the attendees. Um, let me see here. Do one second. Uh, so if you click on phone, uh, it will give you, go to your audio, click on phone, it will give you the number. So a few people can't, uh, can't hear the audio, so we're trying to that quickly. And then we do have a question out of Lawrenceville, Georgia, um, a suburb of Atlanta who owns a travel agency, and she um, is basically out of business and wants to know how she can get access to those funds to help save the company. Okay, sweet. Uh, very, very good question. In fact, uh, you know, towards the second half of this uh, webinar here, we're going to address some of those things there, how you can access different resources that's available. We'll talk through some of that there uh, in the second half of this session here. So today's webinar is going to be about uh, 45 minutes to an hour, depending on the comments and feedback from everybody. Uh, but we kind of uh, slated for about an hour or so. Any, uh, anybody want to chime in in terms of what's happening in your uh, sector of the world? In the chat area, go ahead and put in this and say unmute me and then what we'll do is we'll unmute you so that... Uh, well, there, there are a few hands raised. Uh, let's see. Let's figure out who they are right now. Oh, okay. um, so can you unmute John Cooper? All right, Sean. Uh, Alexis, let me go to Sean. What we'll happened to Sean here? Sean, we can hear you. Uh, you're on. Oh, I didn't mean to be on. I mean, I don't have a question. I now have audio, so thank you very much. Okay, great. <laughs> I'm trying to put my hand down. <laughs> well, since, since, you're, since you're on, go ahead and tell us a little about yourself and. Uh, 
what's going on in your area of the world and where are you from? Um, I am here in Atlanta and okay. my company is TCG Consulting and we provide marketing communications, market research, and uh, the public involvement, basically logistical support services. And right now, um, not much is going on <laughs> in, in, in that side. Yeah, not, not much at all. Yeah, well, hey, I appreciate you joining. And uh, for all of you joining, uh, uh, to help uh, Charlene give you better feedback as she uh, will be sharing in a few minutes, uh, I'll put in the number of employees you have in the chat area so that she can start to get a better sense of the audience here today so that she can help uh, you through the process. And I, I see Charles Digger, he asked to be unmuted. So Charles, you're on. Uh, tell us about uh, your business and uh, a little about yourself, your business, and what's going on with your area of the world. I um, just wanted to uh, join in this because I saw something that was kind of interesting yesterday. And, and they are doing in, I think it was Minnesota, uh, sterilization of masks and that kind of thing using ultraviolet. And I was going to see whether that might be something that would be uh, good to consider pursuing. Um, yeah, if you later on, when I, after I talk about uh, what's going on in the world, after we talk about you know, employers and what you need to do, consider about your employees, uh, remind me that question later. I want to share some. A certain technology and certain uh, UV light technology that's available out there uh, to combat uh, potential viruses. And so remind me that later and I will chime back on that there. Okay, I'd love to because uh, that's very interesting to me. Okay, awesome. All right, last call for anybody. Uh, anybody else want to chime in before uh, I introduce our co host today, Charlene? Uh, Tim Wills, Willis wanted to say something as well. Okay. So let me unmute you, Tim. Tim, you're on. Hey, how are you doing? Hey, I'm well. It's good to hear from you. It, yeah. It takes the virus for us to circle back with each other. That, uh, that's, <laughs> yeah. that's a positive thing. Yeah, I guess. We should never meet under world crises, huh? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, just want to, I just want to quickly introduce myself to those that are on. Uh, I'm Tim Willis. I'm safety director for a general contractor here in Atlanta. Um, and you know, maybe I'm maybe I can be helpful, and maybe I can't. But um, I'm here to uh, you know hear what everyone else can, maybe even provide some insight. Okay, awesome. What's the name of the company you're with? It's FS360. Okay, FS Frank Sam 360.com. That is correct. Okay, great. Well, hey, glad you were able to join, and uh, you know, let's circle back after the webinar to catch up a little bit more. Definitely. And for anybody else, uh, if at any given time you want to chime in uh, in the chat area, just say, hey, unmute me. Or if you have a question, you can type it into the chat area, the question area. And we've got Meyer, we've got Kim, who's going to be monitoring that. And they will let me know, alert me, so I can uh, pause and address some of your comments and questions along the way. All right, so with that said, uh, for those of you who just joined, uh, you can download the PowerPoint presentation. Go to govassociation.org forward slash coronavirus, and that's where you can actually download the PowerPoint. If you go there now, it's not downloaded because I just finished it like 10 minutes ago, hot off the press. So unfortunately, you can't download it, download it now, but I will make it available uh, in a few minutes after the event. And so at about 1.10, it will be on the website. You can download Charlene's document there as well. You can go there. We put a lot of different resources there, so uh, feel free to go there at any given time. Well, hey, it's, a, it's an honor to be here. Uh, I've got Charlene Fitzpatrick with H3C, who is, uh, they're a consulting co uh, company uh, based here in Atlanta, Georgia. She's going to be co-hosting this event with me. Charlene, say hi to everybody. Hello, everybody. So tell us a little about yourself and uh, what you do and, and how you got started in your business. Sure. So my name is Charlene Fitzpatrick. I uh, own a human capital consulting company called Ace3C. And I've, we've had the company, we started it back in 2016. And we primary, but I've been in, uh, I've been an entrepreneur or a business owner since 1998. So Ace3C is my second business that I started to dive into the government space, me and my business partner. 
after some convincing from the people at GCA, Myra and Abe. Uh, so, so we provide um, HR assistance for businesses in the government space, specifically in the area of compliance human resources. And so what's going on today is really hitting hard. Um, so we've got compliance human resources. We also do curriculum development and training as well. And, um, and also some third-party workplace investigations. So, so that's what we've been, we do. We've, we've done it for multiple agencies and entities over the last three or four years and uh, really enjoying working in the government space. And so that's a little bit about the company. Me, I just enjoy having a good time, hitting the links, I'm a golfer, a good glass of wine while I'm cooking. That's what I like to do. <laughs> Okay, so so let's start by uh, talking about how are you adjusting your business? You know, now that the coronavirus pandemic is here, it's a reality. Uh, lots of changes happening every day. We're hearing, uh, you know, that if you have this type of business, you need to be shut down. If you if you're not essential, you you cannot leave your your home. Uh, and so what we are going through a new reality. And uh, my hearts and all of us, you know, we, we feel for our families, we feel for our neighbors, we feel for each other out there. That's really the part of the, uh, the reason for this uh, webinar here. But how are you and your business adjusting to what's going on with uh, COVID-19? So for, for us, we are extremely busy right now. Um, I have done, it's interesting, one of my goals for this year was to become a better yeah. virtual trainer because all of my training and facilitation and speaking is done in person and live typically. But I must say, I've been on what we're calling COVID-19 uh, video conference calls probably two or three times a day, almost every day um for the last uh, couple of weeks few weeks things are changing rapidly and the majority of that is we also work with uh small medium-sized businesses to help them navigate how to engage interact and what should be going on with their employees and then how the regulations are changing because in the beginning of this there were somewhat mixed messages and so people were a bit confused depending upon where they got their news from and as things started to escalate into um, individuals actually getting sick and then cities and states and counties um, as well as the federal government having different parameters around what's required uh, mm -hmm. we have been extremely busy uh, in helping them navigate that by doing yeah. um, in the beginning it was preparedness plans mm -hmm. uh, because it was, okay, it was so, so before hold, hold it that for a second Hold that I'm thought sorry. for a second. We're gonna go and talk about uh, some of the things that you are you are doing to actually help businesses. So so I like that thought there. Um, but as we as we go further, I want to get into as a HR consultant, what are the services, what are the challenges that the businesses that you guys are working with, how you're helping them through this process. But but we'll get to that in one second. Okay. Uh, but you mentioned a little bit about. Uh, where you get your news from and so with that there i want to go into this next part here and then we're going to go to more details in a second here i want to start okay. with a little disclaimer so this webinar is uh for educational purposes only it's not meant for legal advice or professional advice to any of you there is no uh we're going to share a lot of different ideas a lot of different uh information with everybody but that's not meant that uh you know charlene's an hr consultant that, that doesn't necessarily mean that there is a legal and the contractual relation with her organization. She's just sharing for educational purposes. Uh, you know, every effort we've sharing, as you were talking about, you know, where you get your news from. Uh, I know that uh, family members in my family they get their news from Facebook and Twitter, and uh, <laughs> there, there, there's some valid information from there. Uh, yeah. But not everything you get from social media is also accurate. But we've done everything on our end to make sure that the information we're sharing today is as accurate as possible. Uh, but with that said, please do your own due diligence uh, with what we share. Uh, and uh, please seek professional advice as necessary. So with that said, um, this webinar is being recorded. If you have a comment or question, type it into the chat area. Uh, we'll check the chat area. I have Kim and, and Myra uh, and some of our team members checked there and so they will let us know 
uh, when you uh, have a comment, you have a question in the chat area, just say unmute me and then they will let me know. And with that, uh, I will pause and, and let you chime in for a second there. All right, so we're gonna be covering a few things here. How will you prepare for the challenges ahead? Uh, what type of grants, loans, or assistance are available? Uh, if there is a recession, what can you do to stay afloat? We're gonna be talking about what are the contract opportunities in the eye of this chaos? And we're gonna be talking about how to reposition your company to maintain and grow your revenue. Uh, if you are an existing contract or on an existing contract, what should you do? How should you consider that? What HR policy you need to consider and implement? How to prepare your employees to do remote work? And how to manage your staff and manage their workload? How to communicate with compassion uh, to motivate, inspire your team and avoid legal issues? And how to put in place the emergency preparedness plan? And hot off the press, I'm gonna talk about uh, the bipartisan approval from the, uh, the Senate bill uh, that they're actually going to be considering voting that into uh, approving that as we speak right now at about 12 noon. So uh, I'm gonna go through the details, the, the $2 trillion dollars that was just approved. Um, and so, and, and it will be voted on in a few minutes here. So we're gonna talk about that as well, go through, through some of those details. So hang on tight and we're gonna go into all that. We will be doing this here every Wednesday at 12 noon. Uh, and feel free to invite your friends and uh, coworkers and other business owners that you know to, to join us every Wednesday. We're gonna have different uh, co-hosts to join us here. So Charlene, coming back to you. Yes. The question is, as an employer, what do business owners need to consider? There are, are a multitude of things that business owners mm -hmm. need to consider, particularly now. Um, if you have, if you have the thing, yes, thank you for bringing that up. Oh, not that one. The one that I sent you last night. Okay. Oh, last night. Gotcha. Yeah. The one well, okay. yesterday evening, the one I sent you yesterday evening, pull that one up because there are multitudes that um, business owners need to consider. And depending mm -hmm. upon how many employees you have, that's what determines what you need to be considering. And then all and looking into and staying abreast of what's happening, unfortunately, day by day. Uh, it's what's funny to me is you say what's different for me. I didn't watch the news. I, I was just one of those people who I never watched the news. I tell my mother every Saturday morning, why are you spending so much time watching the news? And I told her last Saturday, OK, I'm turning into you. I'm now watching. I know the people are on CNN <laughs> in these stations so that I can stay abreast of what's happening. So uh, if you just go down just a little bit past the disclaimer, uh, stop right there. So because there are going to be a multitude of HR related policies that employers will need to, to stay abreast of, the thing, the, the thing that's important for you is to know where to go to get your information. And so mm -hmm. these specific links right here are going to be critical for you to go to outside of watching the news if you're in Georgia uh, to determine and whatever county that you're in to determine what's happening in that county because different things are happening in different places. There's stay order, stay at home orders in some places and there are in others. And if you're in Atlanta and the metro area, you know that we cross, we cross over in driving in those situations. And so um, when we're engaging and interacting uh, in Georgia. So Cypher Shaw Law Firm, if you're not familiar with them, they're one of the largest law firms in the country and outside of the country. Uh, they actually have a great link, them and Fisher and Phillips uh, Law Firm. We do third-party workplace investigations, and so we've worked with some of these law firms. And so they have a great website that they're keeping up to date and their labor and employment law firms specifically. So that's what's important here. It's one thing to go to one resource to get information where it's like, for example, going to a, um, a foot doctor when you need to go to the eye doctor. Uh, mm -hmm. You don't wanna go just to any attorney to get your information as it relates to your employees, specifically right now. You wanna make sure that they are really up to speed as things are rapidly changing uh, in the world of HR related to your employees. And so the, the two best places that I know of, well, three best places that I know of is Cypher Shaw. They have a set up specifically for COVID-19 and so does Fisher and Phillips. Also the EEOC guidelines is another one 
the EOCs uh, have some guidelines and there's a link there for them. And then naturally the CDC guidelines for employers is another one that you wanna uh, stay abreast of. Now, the reason why I was asking, and I would love to find out, I can't see in the chat here, but I would love to know if we've got people who are who have tuned in and joined us, if they the number of employees that they have. Because if you have 25 employees or and less than 500 employees, then this next thing that you see um, on the screen really impacts your business. So Abe, is it possible? Did anybody chime in as to the number of employees just in general that we've got employers with the number of employees that they have out there yet? Can you see anything? Yes. Um, okay. Well, Allison Barnes says less than 25. Allison Barnes with less than 25. Okay. We have Marcus Crockett. I think the travel agent. Two. Okay. Is it two? Yes. Two. Yes. And I think right. the um the travel agent. I believe she said that. Um, I thought somebody said five employees. Uh, Lori Snow. I can't. Find okay. Yes. Um, Lori Snow has five on payroll. Okay. And anyone else want to chime in on the question? Um, just go into either the chat section or the question area. I think it's only the chat. And then you can uh, type your information in there and we'll get that to Charlene and the others. Thank you, Myra. And just chime right in. Um, that helps me to understand right. a little bit. And Tim Willis has less than 50 employees. Um, okay. Somebody else with three employees. So, um, yeah. Okay. So, so we'll the, probably get more. So this next um, newly enacted coronavirus uh, paid leave law impacts a lot of the people that are on this call because this law, which came into being uh, March the 18th, 2020, uh, it goes into effect April the 2nd. And typically it is for employers with less than 500 employees. Now it's a little different, probably people on the call, if they have 50 or more employees are familiar with the FMLA, uh, Family Medical Leave Act, the law itself. So this is a little different, but similar, similarly different. I like to use that word. Um, I like mm -hmm. to use that word because uh, Family Medical Leave Law Act law that's in existence right now is for employers with 50 or more and there are some specific guidelines around that this is sort of an emergency it's actually called an emergency family medical leave act that they're putting in place specifically because our economy is so driven by um, small business what's defined by the government actually which i learned at gca um, uh, but as small business owners and so those with less than 500 employees this sort of really impacts them and so just the highlights of it is they've put some things into place, keep it going there, Abe, um, so, that, uh, so that employers could provide for, and so that the government, so that employers could provide for their employees. And I think what they're attempting to do is try to um, support uh, the fact that people are going to have to be at home right now um, mm -hmm. and be away from work. And so there's two critical parts to this emergency emergency family medical leave act and the first is the situation where schools and or daycare providers are required to be closed because of some declaration of the city county state or federal government that you're in um, it, there are some parameters around the how they're defining a child and children and they're saying that individuals are entitled up to 12 weeks of leave under the following framework and so for the first 10 days of such leave, it can, it can be unpaid. Uh, the employee, however, may elect. This is critical. Um, I would highlight that word elect because to substitute an accrued paid leave. Because if you're an employer that already has a PTO, which is um, personal time off, any sort of paid leave, whether that's sick, vacation, all those things sort of fit in there together, then, then if you were thinking that your employees would be required to utilize that before this would kick in the gear, 
that's not the case. It, that's what I mean by similarly different to the original FMLA. So the employee may elect to substitute any accrued paid leave, but they don't have to. And so the next thing is after the first 10 days of such leaves, the employer is required to pay the employee two thirds of, and they get into the weeds and into the real details of this. I'm gonna let you guys read some of that and then I can answer any questions related to it, but I don't want to get too deep into it. I wanna make you aware that it exists and that you need to be aware that it exists, particularly if you fit the parameters of the number of employees. There are okay. some things, though, specifically that I want to highlight about that. While then, you're looking for that, can I ask a clarifying question? This is my yes. run for those yes, that might may. be on the line, because you know we've got we've got a myriad of folks, some with less than 25, less than 50, five, two employees. This is for anybody less than 500. Is that yes, correct? And but they are looking at uh, waivers for employers that have less than 25. Oh, thank so the details of that are still unfolding, but they are looking at waivers for employers with less than 25 employees. But yeah, uh, right now it stands that anybody with less than 500 employees and employees, when I say employees, I mean those on your payroll, right? right. So I'm not talking about your contractors. I'm talking right. about your employees that are on your payroll that you pay payroll taxes for. And so, yes, it does. They're looking at waivers uh, for those that have less than 25 employees. But right now, the way it stands is, is anybody with less than 500 employees on their payroll? Good question or good clarification there, Myra. Now, the other big thing about this is that this is temporary, uh, meaning that go back up just a little bit further there, Abe, just a little bit before you get to number two. I think I had it. Oh, what? Oh, maybe I have it down below. But at any rate, uh, this is the job restoration rights that talks about uh, when how an employee would return to work uh, based on them utilizing this leave if they need to. Now you can go on down. Now, the second part is the emergency paid sick leave. There's two parts to that. That was the first part of that. And then the second part of this is where um, there is requires that full-time employees be paid 80 hours of paid sick leave and that a part-time employee be provided paid sick leave equal to the number of hours that that part-time employee generally works. In most cases, employees that work less than between 30 and 35 hours determines uh, whether or not and how you classify them as part-time or full-time. But the idea that um, that they would get two weeks of, the idea is that they would get two weeks period in, in which they would be paid, even if they're teleworking, which we're gonna talk about here in a little bit as well. And so here is the parameters around that. The employee is under, or the situation where this could occur. The employee is under the federal, state, or local COVID-19 isolation order. The employee has been advised by a healthcare provider to self-quarantine due to concerns about it. The employee is experiencing some symptoms. Um, think of somebody that says, you know, I have a cough, a fever, and I'm going to the doctor type of situation. The employee is caring for a person who falls into category one or two. And the employee is caring for a son or daughter, their own, not someone else's, um, whose school or daycare provider is closed and unavailable uh, for them to utilize. And the employee is experiencing any other conditions uh, similarly to uh, COVID-19 themselves. Now, for categories one and to three, the leave pay is capped at no more than $511 per day. For categories four through six, the paid leave is capped at no more than $200 per day. Okay. So Charlene, uh, let's pause it for a second. Let's let's see if there's any questions from anybody online. Sure. Uh, um, we did, yeah, we had one question, and I can't find it now, from um, Marcus. He was asking if this protects employees from, uh, I cannot pull the question box out. Um, thank you, Tim. <laughs> so the question is, are employees protected from being fired during this time? Uh, yes, yes-ish. <laughs> um, the, the, 
I say that because there's when during this time, there's going to be after this is over, unfortunately, there's going to be we are a litigious country. And so there's going to be things that shake out regarding whether or not an employee was eligible to be terminated because there could be a whole nother, there could be a whole bunch of reasons why that person was going to be terminated anyway. And so right now, if, if the company is inhibiting the person from being able to utilize this, um, then, then that could turn into, or if they terminate them because of this, and that gets into a whole nother conversation, then the big R could come into play. And the big R in our world is retaliation. And so you cannot retaliate against an employee as it relates to COVID-19 and their particular situation. But that was a good question. Hopefully that answered that question. Because an employee can still be terminated, but they need to be terminated for cause in any situation, but not for this. So, gotcha. so um, and just as a follow-up to that, you said that they need to be terminated for cause. Georgia is a right to work state, so you can terminate an employee without cause, but in light of this, would it be advisable that you make sure there's cause so that you're not accused of retaliation? Well, I'll say something about that. First, let me say something about your Georgia right to work state. Now, there's a, I can, I have real, written almost dissertations about that. Uh, um, that I'm not going to get into right now because uh, states that are right to work states, most people don't even understand what that really means. But you can be a right to work state, but if you if you terminate an employee and if and if it's not for cause and they have cause, then they can you know seek seek restitution for you terminating them. So I would say anytime that you're terminating an employee, whether it's around COVID-19 during this time or um, or not, that you want to do it with cause, even in a right to work state, because that can cost you uh, just as it can cost you when you're not in a right to work state. But I would also say as it relates to um, uh, terminating employees is you want to try and manage your business as an employer, you want to manage your business and your employees using a lot of compassion right now as it relates to that. Now, this doesn't mean if, for example, if you if your business just doesn't have any work, I think that um, there's somebody on here that they uh, have a travel business. And if you have five employees and there's no work, then you don't have any option. That's a totally different circumstance than if you have employees and they um, need uh, to utilize this emergency FMLA. But if you don't have any business, you don't have any business. And I'm going to address that a little bit from the contracting perspective, because as a business that's doing government contracting work, if the government is, uh, if, they're, if the specific agency you're working with and they're shut down because, you know, they deem that agency as non-essential right now, uh, you know, it may impact you as a contractor. So we're going to cover that in a little bit as well. So, so good stuff here, Charlene. Let, let's continue. Uh, okay, one more question. So says, what about if companies have lost so much business they don't need something for any of their employees? Yeah, I, they, they, they don't have any other option but to either um, lay them off if they can foresee and develop a business plan to stay in business for a later time so they can lay them off right now and um or or furlough them as, as, as some have said but um or if they don't foresee their business starting back up um in the next in a period of time then they may need to terminate them and they what they don't have any options because they don't have a business if you don't have a business you for the employees to actually do work then there's nothing you can do about that. Yeah, and we're going to address a little bit of what the uh, $2 trillion that's been approved by partisan in the Senate, and they're voting on it right now. Uh, what are some other steps you can do before you get to the point where you shut down your business or you have to lay people off? There's some other options that we're going to cover in a second here. 
And then the um, so that's the that's the new again this 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 emergency FMLA they are still shaking it out. I'm literally getting emails from the attorney buddies of mine daily <laughs> regarding okay well if this happens then you need to do this and so it is still being shaked out. So I really would recommend if you fit into this category where you have between 25 if you have even if you have less than 25 you want to pay attention then I would definitely follow, check those links with Cypher Shaw and Fisher and Phillips because it's critical. And then uh, we are going to try to continue to come out with information and updates as well uh, to help people as much as we can. All right, going down. If you're in Georgia, any other oh, questions? Somebody's unmuted. Yeah, well, I don't know. Somebody's unmuted and I can't figure out who it is. So if you've got your line unmuted, if you don't mind muting it while um, the presenters are talking. Okay, go on down there, uh, Abe, to the Georgia Department of Labor emergency rule, because this okay, so one is. Got, Charlene, so we've got about three minutes left. So let's highlight uh, some of the key things from an employee okay. perspective. Read this because this is important. Uh, meaning the um, uh, the Georgia. If you're in Georgia, you need to read this. And then my email address is going to be down there and my phone number. Feel free if you're in Georgia to shoot me an email and we'll try to schedule a call so we can talk about it because they've, they've kind of pulled out what I like to call a little trickery um, uh, <laughs> against small businesses in Georgia. It's a small little trickery, but um, businesses in Georgia already are required to go online about because of the, the massive unemployment claims. They've changed. They switched the process a little bit. And the big part of that, if you look at that last paragraph, um, if you don't comply, then you could be potentially on the hook for reimbursing Georgia for the unemployment funds. And so this one is, is a big deal for employers in Georgia because of all the massive unemployment, unemployment claims. OK, I got one or two minutes. Let's keep it rolling. Community teleworking. OK, so if your employees are teleworking, let me say this. Teleworking is working from home. But you really need to, before that even starts, you've got to define your objectives, rethink how you as an employer and a business owner look at uh, teleworking, leverage technology, sort of like we're doing right now, um, to facilitate better communication and collaboration, and then establish consistent video and teleconferencing calls. Like twice a week, I have a client that's in South Georgia, a small business, and they have to telework because they have to remain in business because they're one of those uh, resources that have to stay in business. And so they are teleworking right now. And um, so we set up a plan for them to telework, but it includes twice a week video conferencing because individuals that are used to coming into the office all the time, they may think that working from home means I get to catch up on Netflix, but it means that you need to work. All right, going down there, communicating with passion. I probably got 60 seconds left. I'm doing pretty good. <laughs> So here's the big thing around this. Your employees, you, your leadership team, everybody in your business, we're all scared. Everybody's scared. And so we really have to be cognizant and sensitive to the fact that everybody is afraid and, and they have anxiety and they have panic, and these sorts of things. And so if you are an essential business that has to remain open right now, and you're in a place in which your workers are working, please reduce or eliminate the gossip, the panic. Um, there's lots of things that are occurring that on the back side of this could cause employers a lot of problem, like sharing confidential information. Go on down, I'm gonna highlight a few of these key things to remember, and then I'm going to be quiet. All right, so. Oh, this one right here, bullet number, you want to communicate openly and oftenly, of course, be available. If you have a um, insurance plan, check to see if you have an EAP plan, because that's important. And then down there, bullet number. Considered to be essential related to supporting first responders then you need to seek some legal advice and support around giving the, your employees something in which they can carry 
while they are traveling to and from work because there are situations now in Cobb County, I actually know of one, where people are getting stopped. So uh, to find out where this is a stay, stay at home order in this county, they're friendly about it, but this is a stay at home order in this county, what are you doing out type of situation? So if you're in one of those counties or your employees are driving in between those, you want to make sure and look into that. Determine what your protocol is going to be as things start to shift. That's down below, uh, Abe. I think you got, oh, you got, look at you, you own it. Determine what that protocol will be as things are changing rapidly and how you're going to respond. And I think Abe's going to have a lot of information about on the business side of how you need to do that. All right. I think my 30 seconds is up. So I'm going well, to turn hey, it Darlene, over. Thanks so much. And uh, we're going to do some Q&A after the session's over. Uh, okay. For anybody who wants to stay a little bit later, uh, feel free to stick around and ask Charlene questions. I want to shift into the government side of, of uh, what we're talking about here as well. And so let me go ahead and start off with the, the uh, $2 trillion, the Senate bill that uh, has gained um, bipartisan approval, and it is um, pending a vote right now. So am I showing the right screen, Mara? Yeah, once you hide that presenter's view, yes. Okay, I have to hide presenter view. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. All right, so uh, hot off the press, 1 a.m. this morning, uh, $2 trillion Senate bill, bipartisan approval. Uh, some of the highlights, though, some, a lot of the details, we don't know what those details are yet. And so we're going to be uh, seeing more details at, as it goes through the vote today. And as the next few days come through, we'll see more details. But from a high level, $500 billion of the $2 trillion is set aside for distress towards distressed companies. Uh, and that's large and small businesses all together. They're in the $500 billion. That's a they deem that as distressed companies. 50 billion is for uh, air carriers, Delta, all the different airline companies out there. They can, they can approach this bucket of funds here for, to support the airline industry because no one's flying right now. A 350 billion is for small business loans. And so for most of you, you are considered a small business. Uh, there's gonna be $350 billion. 10 billion is to cover your payroll. Uh, or debt that's specifically tied to your company with the SBA being the guarantor. So there's gonna be different types of business loans out there, but of that 10 billion will be where the SBA is the guarantor. And uh, I will talk through some of the SBA requirements in a little bit here. 250 billion is for unemployment benefits going to the Department of Labor uh, for all those that will be unemployed uh, during the COVID crisis. Uh, and then 150 billion will go to state and local governments. And so it's gonna flow from the federal to the state, to the counties, to the cities. Uh, and they will, most of them have evoked emergency clauses. And we'll look at some of the emergency clauses in a little bit here. And then 130 billion to hospitals and healthcare workers. And 250 billion for direct payments to individuals. And this is for, citizens, individuals who are uh, taxpayers in the United States and, and uh, permanent residents of the US. So the, of that 250 billion to individuals, let's talk about what that looks like. Uh, $1,200 for individuals who's earning less than $75,000. Uh, 2,400 for a married couple earning less than uh, $150,000. And then for each child, uh, it's $500 per child. So I need to have some more babies. <laughs> and so it's, it's $500 per child. And then there's a scale down that if, you know, it goes up to 99,000 for singles, uh, and then uh, 198,000 for couples with children. Uh, and then, but the highest tier is a 1,200 for individuals, 2,400 for married couples and 500 per child. And then if you're at the 99,000 threshold between 75 and 99,000, there's another tier that's a little bit lower than the 1,200 and 2,400. Those details will be available the next few days as it goes through Congress and uh, it gets approved, final approval and signing to bill. 
So what regulations as a business owner do you need to know? And so let's talk about the defense. Uh, well, let's talk, let's, let's talk about this, these items here quick. Any questions around uh, the bipartisan verbal approvement that uh, was gained earlier this morning and is pending votes right now? which it most likely will pass the Senate uh, at this point because they've already all agreed to. Any questions around this part? Uh, how will this get to you? We don't know yet. And, um, it, and, and it will happen quick. It's not gonna be three months from now. It's gonna happen quick uh, from what all I've seen and what I've been told, but uh, we don't know how and how quickly uh, those details are not available. Uh, to receive this, the only qualification is that you make less than seventy-five thousand. That's it, and you're a permanent resident or citizen. So, if you're a taxpayer, uh, you should receive this here. Uh, how they cut these checks, we still don't know yet at this point. Any other questions? Okay, so let me. I mean, continue. I'm sure there are a lot more questions than there are answers right now. So, I mean, you know, a lot of the questions we just don't have answers for yet. Yeah. Yes, and, and some things we don't know at this point as well. So you're right, Myra. And so, what regulation as a contractor that you need to be aware of? Uh, you need to uh, be aware of the Defense Production Act, a DPA, which is also uh, tied to Defense uh, Priority and Allocation System, or DPAS. And what these two regulations says is that even though you are a business, the government can jump in front of you. So for example, let's assume that uh, you, you're selling a respirator mask to the CDC. Well, the government can say, hey, we gonna, we're gonna take precedent over you and they will evoke these uh, policies and then they force the supplier, the manufacturer, to sell them to them first. So be aware of that as a business. If you have certain supply chain from the manufacturer, uh, if they evoke these two regulations here, it may impact you. So make sure you're communicating with your manufacturer uh, if you're supplying goods, uh, of goods to the government at this point here. Also, what happens if performance is interrupted due to uh, coronavirus? Uh, so you want to. There are different FAR clauses that if you are already on contract with the government, uh, what happens in, in this situation where you're deemed, your service are deemed not essential and the agency that you're working with is are deemed not essential. Uh, in this situation here, there may be suspension of work or stock work order clauses. And uh, you wanna read through FAR 52, uh, 242-14 and dash 15 here. And what this does is it allows uh, the government to order all or part of the work to stop for up to 90 days or to either cancel or terminate the contract. And so what this means is that they can say, hey, we're gonna pause this contract for 90 days. Now in the situation where they pause it for 90 days, when they, when they unpause it, then you can go back to work, everything is normal. If they do cancel the, the, uh, the contract itself, in that situation, it will create hardship for you and your company if you're on an existing contract. And so what you wanna do is you wanna document. And if someone, only the contracting officer can cancel the contract. So their supervisor can't just say, hey, on the phone with you, say, hey, we don't need your services anymore. That is not uh, a valid process. And so if somebody just tells you they don't need you, uh, make sure you have it in writing. If you have it in writing, there is some re uh, remediation that you can take as well to recoup. For example, you might be building a software for a government and you built, uh, you built work already, you just haven't got paid. If they cancel the contract, uh, you are due work that's already been performed and then you have to close down you have to lay off people and you're due money for those work there even though there is not the project will not continue and so keep keep it keep that in mind mm -hmm. question who'll be handling the applications the oh the application for uh the funds uh for business loans it will be the sba 
for money to individuals. We will find that out in the next few days. Richard says, what do you mean by scaled down? Uh, scaled down in terms of the work. So for example, uh, you might have a contract that requires, it, it, it may be a construction contract and it may require people to show up to do work on site. Well, right now it's, you know, it's a non-essential stay at home, a self quarantine or uh, by county, state or a city's ordinance that you can't go to any work that's deemed non-essential or gathering of 10 or more people and you have a crew of 50 people that's on a, on a major work site. So in that situation, what you want to do is you want to openly communicate with the contracting officer and say that, why don't we accelerate some of the design work in, in a phase three or phase two that doesn't require people to be on the field and let, let our people focus on this work so that you can continue to pay us on this, this portion of the work even though we're not actually out there building or doing construction work. So, the, so the, the, the goal to this here is having good and open communication with the contracting officer that you're working with. Now, FAR 52, uh, 249.14 gives excusable delays. And it specifically goes on here and it says that in the event that there is an uh, epidemic, uh, item five here, epidemic or quarantine, which is really what we're in. Uh, so it's already built into the FAR that if you as a employer to the government, uh, a contractor to the government, employee to your, to your uh, employees, if your employee, like an essential employee is out sick and they can't come to work, then this is where FAR 52, 249.14 uh, gives you an excusable delay to, you know, to do the work. And so you can you cite this clause here, talk to the contracting officer and say, hey, uh, my, my department, due to this person, all of my staff, uh, this person have been uh, confirmed with COVID-19. And so the whole department is self-quarantined for the next 15 days. And as such, you can use that, have an excusable delay, all of the delays that you do communicate, make sure you do that in writing so that you can get the reimbursement and, and you can and, and it doesn't impact you and hurt your business. If you don't have it in writing, they can terminate your contract for convenience. So you wanna make sure that you have it in writing. So let's talk about um, what happens if performance is interrupted under FAR 52. Uh, eight and four. This goes into uh, fixed price uh, for service contract and for commercial contracts. If you have a situation where it's a commercial contract, uh, the government will treat that uh, just as a commercial contract. And so read through the details. Um, now, the last part I want to address is uh, 52 241-1, uh, where if they, if you're working in an area uh, that is considered essential and they say, hey, we need more employees. And even though your work for the project might be $2 million uh, scope project, but they want you to quickly, if you're in construction, they say, hey, uh, you are building out this medical center. Now we need you to do it in, instead of uh, six months, we need you to do it in two months. Well, in that situation, you need to hire more construction workers so that you can get it built out fast. Uh, and then, make sure you get the modification in writing so that you can pay your people and you can also uh, under emergency clause you can actually ask for upfront money uh, it does allow for that and for construction it does allow you to have upfront funding um, and so uh, all those are negotiable under emergency clauses all right uh, some additional comments here uh, different law firms they gave additional uh, advice you know that they say that take inventory of the contract, make sure that you're making notes, keeping track of all of that there. Uh, if you're winding down your contract, make sure that you're uh, creating a separate accounting category so that you can reassign that back to the right locations and so forth. Um, and let's go through a, a few other thoughts. There may be some, if you're, if you're in the middle of writing a proposal, there may be some procurement delays. Uh, so you want to pay attention to the due dates. 
Uh, if, if you are in the middle of writing a proposal and your proposal writer gets sick, uh, well, in that situation, you can ask for an extension. Uh, and so there may be different reasons why the procurement may be on your end in terms of delay or uh, on the contracting officer's end, especially areas that are considered non-essential. They may delay those six, uh, you know, six months out. Uh, what we're going to see is this fiscal year is not going to be a traditional fiscal year. So the fiscal year for the state and most counties and cities, uh, right now, we are in the fourth quarter of the fiscal year for the state. Uh, they, their, their fiscal year ends June uh, 30th. And so the federal fiscal year will end October uh, or September 30th. But what we're going to see is a lot of this is going to be delayed 90 days, 60 days, uh, you know, 90 days to 180 days. And so the fiscal year is, is going to be very different this year. So keep that in mind. Uh, there's going to be a delay to CMMC, the cybersecurity uh, implementation. I uh, just read an article that they're considering delay for that. Uh, the CMMC is where every business must have a cybersecurity plan if you're doing work for the DOD. Uh, eventually, it's going to go to all civilian agencies as well. Uh, a lot of that is tied back to the emergency acquisition regulations that's in place right now. But now I want to shift into talking about contracting opportunities. And, uh, and this is where you as a business owner, you want to look at FAR 18.2, which uh, allows you as a business owner to buy differently from the government. And so I want to take a quick second and uh, look at um, FAR 18.2. Point two. Uh, this is actually a very important regulation, and I want to take a second to talk about this here uh, and go into the emergency here. So under uh, 18203, under emergency declaration or major disaster, that's why the state have to declare uh, as a state emergency, the, the country has to, to declare that this is a national emergency. So if the state declares it, it falls under state regulations. If the, if the federal government declares as a national emergency, uh, then FAR 18203 um, is in place. Now, based upon this here, it, it goes into these this next clause here. And let's let's talk about what that means here. Um, Um, let me go to where it talks about micro purchases. Okay, so let's talk about this here. So under emergency uh, clause, traditional micro purchases is ten thousand dollars or less, and they consider that a micro purchase. In a micro purchase, a government agency contract office can buy directly from your company only up to ten thousand dollars through a purchase order. Well, through emergency clauses, they can buy a million dollar project from you and treat it as a micro purchase. Very important regulation. So, so even though your service is more than 10,000, contracting officer through emergency regulations can purchase it as a micro purchase and that threshold is gone. If it's a simplified acquisition threshold, which means that it must go to small businesses only, uh, the threshold is $250,000 or less, the government can actually buy a service from you for $10 million and treat it as a SAP project or S SAT project. So this is actually very good regulations for you to uh, consider. If you're marketing your services to a contracting officer right now, you want to uh, cite FAR 18.2 and, um, and, and, and offer your, you know, if you have emergency type of services that you're uh, engaging a contracted officer with uh, in your uh, subject line, you want to cite FAR 18.2 uh, and then uh, put into your capability statement and your marketing documents of what you can do to support them. So we covered quite a bit. Uh, there's a lot of other opportunities out there uh, that we can kind of look at. Uh, one last important thing here uh, that I want to talk about, uh, which is this here. So. If you're looking for different uh, healthcare centers that you're trying to do work with, uh, this site here, find a healthcare, find a health center.hrsa.gov. Um, 
is actually great. So if I can come in here, I can put in our zip code 30341, and I put in here within 10 mile radius and search, it's going to pull up all of the different healthcare centers that's receiving federal funding related to coronavirus. And so this is specifically related to coronavirus. If you're trying, if you are selling uh, respirators, um, ventilators, if you're selling masks, if you're selling uh, suits, anything, uh, cleaning supplies, mm -hmm. uh, any or a service, uh, these healthcare centers, they must uh, disinfect the facilities uh, oft often. So if you're in the janitorial industry, you want to reach out to them. If you're selling different things related to coronavirus, you can come in here and find all these different facilities so that you can start in, uh, engaging them marketing to them. So use this here, a great resource. So this time we are at the hour. And so I wanna go ahead and pause for any immediate questions uh, that anybody have. And for all of you who's on, I wanna invite you to join us next Wednesday as we continue this dialogue uh, of different things uh, you know, to help businesses in the government market as well as in business as uh, in general as well. So if you have questions or comments, if you wanna make a comment, uh, tell us to unmute you and we'll unmute you. Uh, I will put these uh, slides uh, on a PowerPoint as well as Charlene's slides because I thought uh, I have Charlene's old slides so I'll, I'll put it up onto our website and the website is govassociation.org forward slash coronavirus. Questions or comments? Um, and if you have comments, uh, uh, tell us to unmute you and we will unmute you so you can chime in. Or questions to Charlene as well. At this time. I'm monitoring. No, no questions immediately coming up. But I know. Um, I think Tim Willis in FS360. You're in the federal arena, aren't you? And I've got your mic unmuted. Uh, we currently do work not just in the We also do uh, local government as well. Okay. So, um, just as far as comments, are, are, how have you found your business impacted with what's going on, or are you just kind of shifting to focus on the the crisis at hand? We've, we've actually had to shift a lot of the uh, way we operated. Uh, thankfully, we have tools that are already in place in order to prepare for such a situation. Um, but you know, ultimately, this is a uh, Changed the way we viewed uh, uh, working within an area of construction where you're typically going to be dealing with uh, multiple trades on top of each other. Um, so right. uh, scheduling of different trades, work in different areas um, was essential. Um, educating everyone on proper uh, hygiene and um, making sure that they uh, um, uh, the, the the subcontractors that we deal with uh, provide personnel that are first and foremost healthy um, because uh, we don't know the incubation period um, for COVID-19 or any other uh, viral infection. So we've taken some steps in order to uh, make sure that those that come to our projects to perform work um, are first and foremost uh, in good health and ready to perform without the potential spread of a viral infection on a project. So um, we've, we've put some uh, attestations of uh, readiness uh, records in place uh, to ensure that uh, uh, those subcontractors are also looking at their personnel and making sure that they are right. following up with them to ensure that they are healthy. Uh, so so there's been, there's been a, a more one-on-one, -on -one, more um, involvement uh, with our subcontractors and, and with the personnel that we have uh, uh, do business with. Um, also gone to teleworking, just like we have uh, all are doing currently, uh, which we, we've kind of were in that mode already, um, but we're more so now and kind of amped it up in regards to even video uh, usage of meetings and pre-construction meetings um, and, and kickoff meetings and things of that nature, which uh, to be honest, is, 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 is a better 
situation because of course you know when you're talking about a pre-construction meeting or a kickoff meeting um you're you're always going to find that there's those key players that are not able to make it um but but of course having uh technology at your hand you're there's no no longer an excuse to not make a meeting uh especially when you can uh ex access uh, anywhere uh through phone or computer so this this can be a good thing and it could be a bad thing it don't depend on how you look at it <laughs> Well, it's yeah, a, and I, I think that, thank you for sharing. That, um, he consistently comes, you know, almost on time or a few minutes late to meetings. And even though we're meeting online, <laughs> he's still having traffic issues. So, uh, still showing up online. <laughs> I won't call out Richard's name, but, uh, yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, that's what I was going to say. It's, it's funny. I mean, you know, I'm of the mindset that opportunity just, chaos always creates opportunities and this is a horribly tragic scenario that's affecting literally the entire world but um when we look back on this like in another year or two there are going to be fundamental shifts in the way we do business just globally that will have come from from this whole thing and and some of that's going to be very good but um you know some of it's going to be not so good but again you've got to look for the opportunities and, and everything very well put. thank you for that. yeah so one of the question is hey where do i go to look for opportunities uh opportunities are still published on beta.sam.gov uh, and so it's, it's the same site you can come on here go to beta.sam.gov and uh yeah especially especially if you're here you can go to search for contract opportunities and um, put in here in the you can actually put coronavirus so anything related to coronavirus uh you'll you'll probably see some different items here you can put COVID 19 uh, as a keyword and so use this here to search for opportunities uh most federal opportunities here now for um state and local projects you want to use gov directions which is as a member of gca you have access to this year membership in gca is 499 dollars for the year this software by itself costs about 1200 dollars. so by being a member of gca you automatically get a uh, get get a 1200 software that will allow you to search for opportunities and you can come in here if you're searching for coronavirus related uh, work uh, click on search and it will pull up all the different projects that is that has that word on there and um and so use this these tools here if you if you want to be a member of gc go to govassociation.org click on join and become a member we'll set you up on this uh, uh platform here which is a 1200 platform so you can start looking for state local it gives you all 50 states about 85,000 agencies from county cities to states to federal through this platform here Richard says, mm -hmm. um, are any procurement steps skipped for emergency procurement? Uh, yes, so the question is, uh, under emergency procurement, do they skip certain um, procurement policies? Yes, they do. If it's, uh, if it's a essential items that they need, they will go through uh, FAR 18.2. 18.2 allows the federal government to procure and then states and counties have their own regulations that allows them to buy uh, not using the traditional regulation policies uh, and under emergency purchase they can buy directly from you uh, any amount and they buy it they treat it as a commercial purchase and does that is that the reason why some of the procurements for some of the supplies that are so desperately needed by our health care are they're waiving or relaxing the regulations for purchases from china and other countries that are typically not, you know, can't be sold to the federal government? Uh, yes, yeah, so under the uh, TAA or Trade Agreement Act, certain countries that haven't uh, uh, entered into an agreement with the United States cannot sell their products uh, to the U.S. government. And they can sell it to the commercial market, but they cannot sell it to uh, the U.S. government market. Uh, under that, those traditional clauses, uh, products from China, almost most products from China cannot be sold to the U.S. government. 
but under uh, emergency purchases, uh, if you're selling respirator, masks, ventilators, anything like that, the government need it right now. And so they're waiving some of those there. Uh, but you want to check if it's uh, counties, cities, uh, and it's federal funds, it still applies. But you want to specifically check with the agency that you're working with and say, hey, uh, does this this product is from China? Uh, does that mean you are waiving TAA regulations? And if that's the case, then uh, you can sell direct. And, and everything I've heard is that they are waiving TAA, but I can't confirm that. And I'm not an attorney, so I haven't checked the regulations yet. Uh, Richard said, are all emergency procurements published? Uh, no. Uh, right now, they, they're using commercial purchasing methods meaning that as a contracting officer, if my department, the agency that I'm serving, I'm supporting, if they need something, they can pick up the phone and just start calling and purchasing that way. They don't have to publish it. And so, so you have to be proactive in this environment. If you're looking for opportunities, you have to engage the contracting officer. You have to do marketing and, and, and use FAR 18 too as uh, emergency purchase, of why you're engaging them, or you can actually use uh, FAR 15.6. Uh, FAR 15.6 is unsolicited proposal. If you have a solution and the gov you know that the government have a problem, they need your solution, They're, they just haven't put out a uh, solicitation to buy it, you can use FAR 15.6 uh, to put in an unsolicited proposal to the government and they can use that to purchase from you as well. Um, and Wayne Wirtz says, where can I find written dollar limits? You mentioned when talking about uh, FAR 18. Uh, FAR, FAR 18.2, uh, the question is, um, what is the limit? Under FAR 18.2, there is no limit. It's, the limit is at the discretion of the contracting officer and their budget. And so if they want to buy something as a micro purchase in a micro purchase threshold is ten thousand, and they want to spend five hundred thousand dollars and do a purchase order uh, and treat it as a micro purchase. They can do that. All right. Uh, last call for questions. Um, Charlene, any other comments? Uh, you know, as uh, we're looking for last call for questions, any any other uh, comments before we wrap up here? I would say, stay on top of the news. Remember to communicate with compassion when it relates to your employees and try as best you can to protect your investment and feel free to reach out if you need any assistance. Yeah, and as it relates to investment, we're gonna bring in a um, you know, investment advisor so they can share their opinions in terms of how to treat your investment during this time here. In the oh, I'm talking about your, your business and your employees. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yes. Yeah, your investment in terms of your staff. Yes, we're going to, uh, yeah, absolutely. That's your most important investment, which is your, your human capital. Yes, human capital. Yes, your human capital. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, one last question. Which agencies have increased spending? Which agency, the question is, which agencies have increased spending? Um, pretty much. All agency tied to HHS, which is a, a Health and Human Services, with NIH, with CDC, with all of your hospital systems, all of your health departments, the county health departments, anyone tied to health, uh, all budgets have increased. There's a lot of funding going in that direction. Uh, and then uh, all the other agencies, their budget, have not been decreased. So there's no budget that has been decreased at this point here. All the purchasing, all the requirements that's already budgeted for on, on route that's gonna be procured this uh, fiscal year, that's still happening. It may get delayed. It may uh, get delayed a few weeks, a few months, or maybe even push out to a year completely. Uh, but uh, those uh, funding have not been deallocated at this point. Charles. Stiger says, um, if you'd like to be unmuted, I think you might have a question. Okay. Charles Stiger. 
So Charles, uh, hey, you said that we could talk at the end about uh, mm -hmm. sterilization stuff. I wanted to do that. If, uh, I didn't know whether it was oh, now yes. or, or offline yes. or how you wanted to do it, but this is good. I'll share right now. Uh, so all those who are on here, you you actually get some bonus tips. I'm gonna have to go. I've got to get ready for another call. <laughs> all right, Charlene. Hey, thanks so much for joining us. This is just extra time. You know, our official ending was at one o'clock. I appreciate everybody sticking around. Charlene, thanks so much for being a great host with me today. Thank you. Uh, and uh, thanks, we'll see you. Charlene. Thank, Thank you, you for Charlene. having me. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. All right. And uh, for all of you, you're sticking around. Uh, you know, I'll stick around. This is just bonus time now. So our official webinar is over. Uh, if you have other questions, I'll stick around for a few more minutes. But Charles uh, asked uh, what type of uh sterilization what type of uv lighting equipments are out there and so there's lots of different treatments in terms of how you kill bacteria and virus and this is actually a very innovative uh technology uh, that i found about two three years ago and this is called the xenix robot and this little equipment here um is a robot that you roll into, it uses uh, UV light. And it uses no chemical except UV light itself. And you, you roll it into a room, you put up a sign that says don't enter the room, and you set the timer. And then you know, if you can set the timer for like three minutes, and in three minutes, the little robot head shows up here. It pops up, and then it emits lights. And as it emits the lights, it kills every single, uh, organism that has dna so bacteria to viruses anything that has a uh, has a dna that this light touches it dies uh and and then you uh and then after the timer goes off you go back in you rotate it to another side of the room and you do you know maybe two or three angles from that room and so this here saves you a lot of time for example you don't have to wipe down something if the light touches it it's dead and so this is kind of like a very innovative um, uh, solution. This robot here from the quote that I saw a while back is like 90,000. But school systems, any high level, you know, uh, hospitals, uh, anybody, any uni university before school goes back in, they're going to need something like this. Sir. Now, the traditional way is to uh, use um, um what we called a sprayer a so so traditionally most people will use something like this here uh which is a a fumigator some type of device like this and this is a good option as well so with this here, if, if you want, if you're in the janitor service or if you're looking to expand your service, you might be an IT company, but you're saying, hey, you know what? I'm not getting any work right now for IT, so I'm going to go and uh, turn my man manpower into, into this here and uh, or train people to do different services. I'm not suggesting you do that, but you, you look thinking out of the box. And so this here, you actually spray and then you uh, some requires wiping down, but most of this here does not require wiping down and then within a certain number of hours uh, it becomes neutralized and so the chemical is not toxic um, at that point but it kills everything that it touches so there's different options like this here but i like the xenix robot uh, i've actually seen a real one uh, and seen it um, some if you watch some youtube videos on the xenix robot uh, and there's other types of robots that use uh, uv lighting that's a lot uh, more affordable as well this is just kind of like one of the industry standard um, Shana or Shina Hutchins. Mm -hmm. um, like to be She's okay. Here. So Shina, uh, you're unmuted. Go ahead and unmute yourself. Ms. Hutchins, uh, you can unmute yourself and, and make comments or ask questions. Can you hear me? Yes, you're on. 
Okay, good day, A. Thank you so much for um, unmuting me and allowing me to ask my question. I'm actually new to the Government Contractors Association and I haven't purchased a membership yet. I was going through your options of the monthly versus the yearly. Um, because we're such a new business, um, what we do, I am a solid waste container cleaning company. We mm -hmm. sanitize, disinfect, and deodorize residential trash bins as well as commercial dumpsters and dumpster pads. And we're trying to find contracts on to be able to help the school systems, uh, especially out in the Cobb County, Fulton County, and Cherokee area. Um, and some of the opportunities you have with your membership, I was wondering if we were to purchase the monthly membership, would we still get the access to uh, the opportunities that you have um, and, and the, inf the resources that you have versus the yearly? Uh, the the uh, resource of GovDirection is only available to annual members. So, yeah. and, and that's because we have a, uh, unless Richard, Richard, are you still on? Can we make an exemption during coronavirus or is, because traditionally it's only available to the annual members. Um, okay. Richard, is, is that something that, uh, you know, your, Richard has the power to, to authorize abnormal situations like this there. So, so send send me an email and I'll check with Richard on that there. Um, and okay. What we do we'll is do. we want to help all of our businesses during this time here. I understand that, that financially things are tight, and so um, you know, let me know, uh, Richard, uh, and uh, and I'll check with Richard. Uh, Shane, I just shoot me an email. Uh, now, you mentioned that you're a new company entering to the government market. Your services you know, needed immediately right now. And here's what I uh, I'm reflecting back to 2008. Uh, this coronavirus uh, pandemic here, it can potentially lead to a, a major recession. And, and I remember back in 2008 when, there, when the recession was here, as the opportunities in the commercial market slowed down and dried up, people flocked into the government market because there were shovel-ready projects, stimulus money that was coming out. And the government said, hey, we're going to put all these funds out there so that uh, businesses can continue to do work for government agencies and so forth. So if you're new and you're starting the government market or if you're already in the government market, this is not the time to quit. This is not the time to slow down. This is the time to invest more into the government market, pour more of your resources into the government sector, because as the commercial market slows down, business is going to reinvent themselves. They're going to see where the money is at and they're going to flock into the government market, which I personally saw. Uh, in 2008 and mm -hmm. if you're already in it stay in it or if you're entering into it go faster uh, before everybody else starts to get into this the government market so that you're ahead of everybody and you're beating the crowd okay we'll do thank you mm -hmm. all right so uh if there's no other questions we're going to wrap up here i appreciate everybody joining us uh it's been fun uh Look out for uh, our next webinar, which is next Wednesday. Invite your friends and ask your people uh, to come. Uh, this here, uh, our, this video here or this session is recorded. If you want to watch the replay, it will be on a YouTube channel. And thanks so much, everybody. And appreciate all of our staff and, and our uh, support here uh, from Kim, Myra, and Richard, and Jackie, everybody else coming on to help make sure that this uh, webinar went well. So see you guys next Wednesday. Take care.